Hallo, Achaarschen. Hallo, Achaarschen. Hallo, Achaarschen. I vaguely remember hearing, when I was a kid, a puppeteer or a cartoon voice actor discussing the idea of making his voice big or small to match the character he was playing. The misconception, he told us, was that you just talk in a higher pitch to be small and in a lower pitch to be big. But instead, he said that what you should do is make your mouth small or big and you can use the pitch as well to enhance that effect. But the main effect comes from mouth size and not from pitch. Listen again. Hello, Akharshjan. Hello, Akharshjan. Hello, Akharshjan. What I'm trying to do there is keep the basic pitch of my voice the same in all three. I'm not sure if I'm actually achieving that, but I'm trying. Instead, I'm attempting to vary the quality or the timbre of my voice. I change the size of the inside of my mouth and I move my mouth more or less while speaking to indicate the size. You hear that effortlessly. Your brain perceives and interprets the size of my mouth without you even thinking about it. You simply feel the size. This might seem like a bit of a tangent on a channel about speaking Gaelic, but I wanted to start with something you already kind of know to help you understand something that you probably don't yet. People who've got a bit of Gaelic under their belts already might have an inkling of what I'm heading towards. But if you don't, please bear with me just a little bit longer. Kerst, back to English for one more little point before we reach the Gaelic. In English, what sound does this letter make? And what about this one? Well, while Caroline and Colin say k, and Gary and Gabby Gunn say g, Cynthia and Cedric say s, and George and Georgina say j. What's going on here? Well, i, e, and e are all made by having the tongue near the roof of the mouth, leaving a small gap, whereas a, o, o, a and oo have the tongue much lower down and this leaves a big gap for the sound to resonate in the mouth. Consider that teeny weeny feels very small and humongous feels really big. You may think that's just coincidence and the effect of association but there's a school of linguistics that says it's not and while not all words fall into this pattern statistically it's far more likely to see these lower bigger vowels in words meaning big and higher, smaller vowels in words meaning small. There are exceptions, of course, and English big and small are, in effect, the wrong way round. Of course, you know Gaelic's better. More, for example, is a very big sounding word with its deep, low, long O, and beck is very small sounding with its short e at the top and back of the mouth. This concept of bigness and smallness is fundamental to Gaelic. If you've never heard of it, in Gaelic we talk about the slender broad distinction. E, e, e. These sounds are made near the top of the mouth. There's a narrow gap over the tongue, so they are termed slender. But a, o, o, u. These are all made lower down, leaving a wider gap, which we call broad. Nishje. In English, this distinction only affects two consonants, C and G, as in Cynthia and Georgina, but in Gaelic, practically every consonant is affected to a lesser or greater degree, although almost entirely differently to how it works in English. As we move from broad to slender, the mouth shrinks. Everything moves to nearer the top of the mouth, but also to nearer the middle. Consider mm. That's a broad double N, and it's very, very big sounding. The 
tip of my tongue is touching my teeth. Or should I say, the tip of my tongue is touching my teeth. And that leaves a huge cavern in my mouth, relatively speaking. What would happen if I moved the tip of the tongue to the middle? Well, I'd get n, which still sounds very big because I've got to drop my jaw to give myself enough space to do it. And then there's this big gap behind my tongue. Rish, if I want to make a truly small sound, I can't use the tip of my tongue. So slender sounds in Gaelic tend to use the middle of the tongue, or at least more than just the tip. Now listen to these three words and note how the N sound seems to feel smaller each time. Chaum. Chene. Chene. That's chaum or tight. Chene, fire. And chene, tighter. So chaum is very big. It's a strong, broad N. And the tip of your tongue is touching your front teeth. Chene. Moderate size. This is a weekend and it's essentially the same in broad and slender position, as well as being very similar to an English N. Compare chena with tana, thinner watery. And finally, we have chenye, very small sounding. This is a strong slender N and the tip of your tongue is dropped down out of the way, leaving the middle of your tongue to do all the work pushing up to the middle of the top of your mouth. It's not ng, it's further forward than that. If you speak Spanish, it's effectively ñ of España. If you speak French, it's like the end of Champagne. And if you speak Italian, it's like the start of gnocchi. Now, if you picture this progression from broad to slender via the weak form, you're seeing a line from lower and further forward to higher and further back. But if you start at the back with something like GH, it moves from lower and further back to higher and further forward. R, Y, R, Y. So if we draw those two lines, N, 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 R, yeah, we're left with a triangle. So you can picture pronunciation as being like a pyramid. The further you are from the top, the broader the area. The nearer the top, the narrower. In Gaelic, slender sounds are trying to move to the top of a pyramid inside your mouth and broad ones are heading for the base. This, I hope, will help with some of the initially weirder sounding broad and slender pairs. You may have heard that broad T is like English T and a slender one like English CH. But compare the Gaelic for fire that we had earlier, chena, with the English chain. Chena, chain, chena, chain. So you can probably hear a difference in what I'm saying, even if you can't quite tell what it is. And hopefully, you will be tuning into the idea of big and small, and you might be starting to realise that the English ch sounds bigger than the Gaelic ch. You may even have realised from what I've said already that chain uses the tip of your tongue more or less. And maybe chena doesn't. Now, to start saying a slender T, let's start by doing something that isn't the right sound, okay? Try saying T, 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 but instead use the middle of your tongue and the roof of your mouth. T, T, T. Try saying that in chena. Chena, chena, chena. It doesn't sound the same. 
but actually it's not a bad first approximation. I'm a bit of a weirdo and I decided that I would do this when I started learning. I made my slender T more T-like and I made my slender D J more D-like. Yeah. Now that's a very tense, clumsy pronunciation and very quickly I relaxed into natural pronunciation. But to me, what I thought was important was to teach my brain that it was not English ch. Because if you let your brain believe that, you might never even notice that it's wrong. Because it just sounds close enough. On that topic, Gallic broad t isn't the same as English t either. If we go back to the big small idea, well, Gallic slender t is smaller than English t, Gallic broad t, surprise, surprise, it's bigger than English T. Going back to the pyramid analogy, the slender T is near the apex and the broad T is near the base, with English T somewhere in the middle. How are we going to make our T bigger and broader than in English? Touch the tip of your teeth with your tongue. If you try saying that in English, it feels clumsy. It almost feels like your tongue's swollen, like maybe after a trip to the dentist. But that's effectively what the Gallic T does. Now consider S. Say S. Feel where your tongue is. S. The tip is most likely pointing more or less directly at that funny little ridge a centimetre or so behind your top teeth. Try instead bunching up the middle of your tongue from behind and try to say an S sound with the middle of your tongue behind that ridge. Shh, shh. See, that's not exactly the same as a SH sound in English, but it's got some similarities. Shh, shh. Smaller, it's softer, it's squishier. Now compare the lowland name Shaw with the Gaelic for this. Shaw. 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 You may be tempted to describe the difference as being that the Gaelic one is said in a Gaelic accent. But it's not just accent. They are subtly different sounds. Kashmaha. There are lots more consonants I could talk about. The only one I'm going to talk about now is R, which was the request that triggered this video. So Gaelic R, and in particular the slender R, is often described by many as being like TH in English. But how could a slender sound be like TH? In English, TH, v, our tongue is next to the tip of our teeth, and our mouth is big and deep. English TH is a very broad sound. It's a big mouth sound. In fact, it may be one of the biggest sounds in the English language, depending on how you look at things. Now, if you say a broad sound for a slender sound, that's going to be pretty hard for a Gaelic-speaking brain to interpret. Surely, it's not the same thing. So what is it that makes the slender R sound sound like V to an English speaker? Well, the main characteristic of v is that you have hissy air escaping around a stiff, unmoving tongue, which, if you think about it, is the same core characteristic as s. s. Now, let's try a sound that isn't in Gaelic. Say s, then move the tip of your tongue forward towards the teeth. S. It should flatten out a bit as it goes. Just a little gap between your tongue and the roof of your mouth, between that funny ridge and your teeth. You'll start to get a whistling sound as you do it. The whistling you're hearing is from the air hitting your bottom teeth, and you might even feel it bouncing around them. A similar thing happens with a Gallic slender R. Z, 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 z
So the R and the S in English are in very similar positions, which is why it's easy to say them next to each other. Cars, readers, etc. If you pronounce your R's at all. But to get the Gallic slender R, move your R forwards like you did with the S. You should be able to get the short R-like thump and the whistling hiss off the bottom teeth. Zzz, zzz. That whistle should continue maybe a little bit after the R sound has stopped. Zzz. Cahiz. Cahiz. Could you? If you're interested in learning more on the topic of pronunciation, there's only one book worth mentioning, and that's Blas na Gaelic by Michal Bauer. It's very big and very thorough, describing sounds of the language. It's aimed squarely at beginners. It's full of charts and diagrams showing how to form the pronunciations. It avoids a lot of the jargon that linguists use in technical descriptions of pronunciation. And I'll pop a link in the video description for anyone who wants to pick up a copy. Achanish, shin in video. That's enough for one video. Cheerian drasta. Cheerian drasta. Cheerian drasta.